Good morning and welcome to this Biomechanically Focused Masterclass. So my name is Yolanda. I'm a three-star Franklin Method equestrian coach, an accredited rider biomechanics coach and a breath coach. So with me today, we have the lovely Beck and her beautiful boy, Elfie. Beck, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and Elfie? Uh, so I'm Beck. I've been riding all my life. Um, this is Alfie, my eight-year-old warm blood cross. Um, we're currently novice training elementary. Um, yeah, and definitely these lessons and the biomechanic lessons have definitely improved my riding and posture and I'm absolutely loving them. Right, so the focus, thanks Beck. So we're here at Mountain View Stables. It's a gorgeous facility out in Queensland, Australia. Now, uh, the focus for today's session is we're going to be working with Beck's contact. But like all biomechanic sessions, we start first with a little bit of breath work. We make sure that Beck's pelvis is in the most neutral position to support her body. And then we start working on the finer points like contact. And, and when I say finer, I mean all important points. But we have to make sure the foundations are in place first. So um, Beck and I have worked together before and for today's session we're going to be focusing on the contact. But like with all biomechanically focused sessions, we first start by making sure that Beck's pelvis is in the most neutral position to support her torso. So we're going to start with a little bit of seat work, a little bit of warm up in terms of where her pelvis is. We're also going to look at breath because this is one of the things this is one of the things that I found with riders. A lot of riders breathe through their upper chest. We're going to be using, or rather Beck's going to be using her breath to mobilize the diaphragm and also to relax her pelvic floor. Right, so uh, the method we're using is Franklin Method Equestrian. Beck is familiar with the methodology, but I'll explain to you as we go along exactly what we're looking for. The wonderful thing about Elfie the very large Alfie is he gives us direct feedback so you'll see throughout the session as Beck makes changes Alfie will reward her he'll reward her by lifting his back bringing his hind leg forward and softening in the contact but that's something we work towards right so first up let's have a quick look at how Beck is breathing this morning so Beck, Beck is what I would call a high tone rider and my job as an instructor is to make sure that this high tone doesn't translate into tension. And the best way to do that is to start working with the diaphragm. Now the interesting thing with the diaphragm is that as we breathe in, the diaphragm is domed under the ribcage. As we breathe in, the diaphragm comes down, it pulls the lungs down and draws oxygen into the lungs. But in that process, the organs have to shift somewhere. So as your diaphragm comes down, your organs shift slightly forward and it activates your pelvic floor as well. So when you, when you look at your breathing and you breathe specifically taking note of your diaphragm, you can actually feel the movement translating to the pelvic floor. And this is one of the best ways to start your coaching or your riding session. So it really helps engage the core internally, Elfie, <laughs> and it also starts to work the diaphragm. And another tip here is it's a really good way to get the rider, in this case Beck, to stop thinking about grocery lists, things to do, uh, etc. And it brings her into her body. And, and that's the most important part of any biomechanically focused session, is that the rider is in the moment and aware. So I'm going to hold Alfie so that he doesn't go a wandering. <laughs> and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Beck to dome her hands like this under a ribcage in a dome. Like mm -hmm. so. Yes. And as you inhale, I want you to bring your hands down and lengthen. Yes. As you exhale, float your diaphragm up. So again, a deep inhale through the nose. <laughs> and an exhale. Right, the next time you do it, Beck, I want you to see if you can feel a change in your pelvic floor or your hip joints. Hold on, buddy. So a deep inhale, diaphragm comes down, feel it translate all the way down, and exhale, the diaphragm comes back up again. Good. So in this last breath, I want us to make sure that you can feel the expansion of your rib cage. So on the on the side or in between each rib we have muscles we have an intercostal system here and as we inhale the rib cage actually moves out like bellows so let's breathe into your ribs good there uh -huh. 
Elfi. Nice there, Beck. Right, so now I know that Beck's aware of her, what's happening inside her body. Alfie's very aware of my shirt <laughs> and determined to nibble. So we know that oh, Beck is inside her body. She's aware of her breath. I'm just going to loosen off the jaw a little bit because I saw a little bit of tension in the breathing. And then we'll start with the pelvic floor. So uh, Beck, what I want you to do is I want you to take your tongue and run it behind your top molar, your bottom molar, Left, right, just circle around your mouth a few times. Good. <laughs> Close your lips. Make sure your teeth are slightly open. Put your tongue behind your front teeth and breathe. Alfie. <laughs> Let's do that again. All good? Mm -hmm. Right, let's have a look at that pelvic floor. So you can take your reins. I'm going to ask Beck to walk away from us and then walk back towards us so that she can feel exactly what's happening in her pelvic floor this morning. To do this, I'm just going to bring the pelvis model so we can just work through a little bit of the anatomy of where she should be sitting in the saddle. Right, so what I want to do is I want um, I want Beck to get her pelvis in the most neutral position to support her spine. So if we think of the pelvis as the, the first point of contact with the horse, right, we want to make sure that the hip joints can move freely. We want to make sure that the pelvis can move freely. So there's, there's not a huge amount of movement opportunity. I mean, things do move. There's a joint here at the pubic bone. There's two joints at the back of the S, um, two SI joints at the back of the sacrum. But we want to make sure that Beck is A, sitting equally on both sides of her pelvis. So if you just take a quick look in here, Beck, I, when you walk away from us, what I want you to do is try and ascertain where on the seat bone you're sitting. Mm -hmm. Are you sitting more towards the pointy bit? Yep. Are you sitting in front of the pointy bit, which will lead to a dropping of the pubic bone and a consequently an arch in the lower back? Or are you sitting right at the back of the seat bone, which will put you into more of a chair position? So we're going to ask Beck to walk towards the, uh, away from the camera and then back towards the camera so she can get a good feel of where she's sitting in terms of her pelvis and the saddle. So as you walk away from us, Beck, I want you to feel left seat bone, right seat bone. Do you have equal weight in your seat bones? Now this is where I really, as a coach, I really appreciate these shirts because it gives me very clear line of sight as while Beck is checking what her pelvis is doing, I can see what her shoulders are doing. Super useful as a coach. And back towards us, Beck. So remember, we're, we're trying to ascertain where on the seat bone you're sitting. We also want to know if you have equal weight left to right and if the right side is moving the same as the left side. Hey, gorgeous. Right, what did you feel? Um, more pressure to my left and probably sliding slightly rolled forward. Okay, so what Beck has found in that, uh, just in that brief walk is that she has, she's heavier on the left side of her body and that her torso is coming slightly forward. So this means that she's probably sitting a little bit uh, closer to her pubic bone that we'd like her to do. Okay, so which side most comfortable for you? Which side has a better range of motion? Probably my right. Okay. And when you think about your right side, what attribute would you give? Is it a slide and a glide? Is it smooth? I want us to put some form of imagery into that right side so we can replicate it to the left. I feel like it is quite supple. It is quite, you know, slide and glide and I am quite soft on that side. I feel quite rigid to my left. Okay. What we're going to do now is we're going to ask Beck to place one Franklin ball under the side that is not gliding as much as the other side. Now these balls are really invaluable in terms of proprioception. And we'll talk a little bit about proprioception later, but just as a snapshot, we're, we're saying to the brain, hey brain, don't forget about the seat bone. Hey brain, I want you to, because remember all movement starts with the brain. So we want you to take the smooth feeling on the right seat bone and 
I want you to reproduce it on the left side. So the Franklin ball just gives us a little bit of direct feedback, seat bone to brain, to say, all right, let's, let's level things out. So under your left seat bone, and we're going to ask Beck just to walk. She can walk in a circle, a straight line. It doesn't really matter for us. But I just want her body to get used to the feeling that there is something under that left seat bone that's different. So here you would expect the rider to feel very unbalanced. I've yet to, to have a rider that feels that this is, is something that unbalances them in the saddle. Remember Beck, as you walk, I want you to look for that same feeling, that imagery of a slide and a glide on the left side. Now what you'll see here, as Beck does this, you'll notice that her shoulder position is changing. So this is coming from a little bit of stiffness in the lower back. So what, because the seat bone doesn't want to move, the uh, lower back, and in this case, of course, the upper back is coming forward to compensate for that movement. Beck's job now is to make sure that the left side of her pelvis is feeling exactly the same as the right side of her pelvis. Because remember, any shift in weight, particularly an, um, any form of asymmetry or limited range of motion, Alfie's going to feel. And he's going to respond by stepping underneath Beck's weight to balance himself out. Let's go for a walk and tell us how that seat bone feels. Right, so she's put some softness back in the seat bone. You'll also notice that her shoulders are not as active now. So the upper body has become less active now that we've put more range of motion into the seat bone. We've followed a, a, a typical Franklin method methodology approach. We've experienced a movement. We found a block or a, a more limited range of motion in one part of the body. We've made a plan to mobilize that part of the body. We've implemented the plan and now we compare. So Beck, in that walk, after we took the ball away, how did you feel your left seat bone versus your right seat bone? Much softer yeah. um, and I felt like I was sitting into him as well, but I also felt that I was able to sit back and I wasn't sort of perched forward with a forward rotation. All right, so that for us is really good feedback and now Beck has a mental, a mental image along with the feeling in her body of how she needs her pelvis to move. So the next part of our warm-up, and this is something that I do in every coaching session, is I'm going to put Beck in the cross bands. Now, I really like these Equest cross bands, and I've been using something similar for years because it, it does a number of things for me. Number one, it stabilizes the upper body. Right, so not only do we have the benefit of the rider not having to sometimes fight against her symmetries or asymmetries as she's riding, but it, it, it gives us that stability. But it's also fabulous for proprioception. So I'll take you through the process that I use, and then I use it to warm up the hip joints, the hip flexors, and the pelvis even more. So uh, Beck knows the bands. She loves the bands. She refers to them as a wonderful form of torture. <laughs> Uh, but they do a really good job. So I'll just pop up, get the bands. Cross okay. bands, invaluable part of the warm up for me. And, and I find it, as um, I might have mentioned before, particularly useful when it comes to warming up the pelvis. So I'm going to ask Beck to put the cross bands on. We've worked with them before. So just as, as a safety precaution, if you have someone with you, just ask them to hold the front end of the horse while you put the bands on. So. Um, Alfie knows the bands, we don't have to do it this time, but it, it's just better to be safe than sorry. So back up and over your shoulder. So this is interesting because this gives me the opportunity already to see something that Beck and I need to work on. She has more weight on the outside of her foot than on the inside of her foot. So as we're riding, you will see, I will ask her to find her big toe and put a little more pressure underneath the big toe. Right, I'm just gonna pop the band on the other side. Right, so before we go into motion, I'm gonna run through a couple of checkpoints with Beck. So the first thing I want to establish is I want to establish a connection between this foot and her inside shoulder. 
So Beck, if you can just roll your inside shoulder, just stay with the inside for the moment, just roll the inside, the other one, <laughs> right? Now when you move that shoulder, can you feel the movement translating to here? Yeah. All right, so this is the connection that we want to look for when we're riding because we need to use the body as an integrated system. So Beck, pulse your heel. Remember, we want soft, springy ankles, and this is fabulous for soft, springy ankles. Now, when you do that, can you feel that translate yep. all the way across your back to the shoulder? Yes. Right, so sometimes as riders, we forget that the body is one integrated unit. Right, so this is a really good way to join these dots for a rider. So let's just do the, the outside shoulder and we'll feel that on the heel, on the inside. Good. And then pulse the heel. You're feeling connected? Yeah. Right, they're connected and ready to go. Okay, so we're going to start in walk so that Beck can get the feel of the band. So just walking on Beck. Right, so now that uh, Beck's in motion with the bands on her, I know that her torso is stable. I know that she has a good feeling across the back of her shoulder blades or scapulars and that she has springy ankles. And the ankle piece is quite interesting. With the band underneath the heel, the natural, um, or the way the band works is it almost wants to pull you into a fetal position, right? So it wants to round your shoulders, it wants to draw the back of the heel up. So we're looking for the rider to strengthen that back line. So I'm going to ask Beck as she walks, she's going to walk a 20 meter circle around us, she's going to walk away from us in a long diagonal and then towards us, I'm going to ask her to find that pulse on the back of her heel. Now, it's, it's also something I find with riders that do a lot of their schooling with spurs on. They look to activate with the lower part of the heel and not the calf. So, Beck, as you walk, I just want you to pulse down through the back of your heel. So, we've got to keep those ankles springy. Remember, they have to absorb the movement. And look for activation with the inside of your calf. So, a couple of strides, legs off. Take them right off. Now leg on. Ah, and Alfie gives us such good feedback every time as to what he's expecting from the rider and what he can feel. So legs off. Good boy. Leg on. Now remember when you want leg on, first leg. Don't be tempted to use your pelvis to push him forward. This is really nice. Okay, but as you walk, I want you to bring your attention into your hip joints. So we want to make sure that that fluidity that you found with the, the balls underneath your seat bones, that it carries over into the saddle now. So remember, we spoke, you, know, you had an image that was a, a flow and a glide and a, really a smooth feeling. Good there, Beck. Good there. Left to right, left to right, left to right. Now, as Beck walks, you can see her torso has dropped back a little bit. So I'm going to ask her to put a crease in her belly button line. So drop the front of her rib cage down just a little to stabilize the torso. That is nice. Good job there, Beck. Rising trot. Now a different motion in rising trot because Beck really has to pull up through the bands. Good. So remember, we want light touch with the seat. Just light touch and a hover, hover. Nice there, Beck. Really nice. Keep the fluidity in your heels. Pulse, pulse, pulse. Nice, Beck. Nice. Now I do hope Beck is breathing. <laughs> so always a gentle reminder, every couple of strides, focus in on your breath. Send your diaphragm down, relax your pelvic floor and use your internal core structure to stabilize yourself. This is really lovely, Beck. Good, good there. Right, so we're gonna, in the trot, we're gonna mobilize, work on mobilizing Beck's pelvis just a little bit, so this is still part of our warm-up. Beck, what I want you to do is I want you to sit, sit, rise. Sit, sit, rise. So this means every couple of strides, she's rising on the incorrect diagonal. And this is really good for A, mobilizing the pelvis, but B, 
especially if you find you're losing your horse's attention and with the young ones it's something that taps them into your body quite quickly so sit sit rise sit sit rise good keep the springiness in those heels back remember soft ankles lovely there back right let's change it up we'll change the rein sit sit nice there back and keep that sit really light so light brush with the saddle and a hover and a hover and a hover lovely back so there Alfie rewarded her by opening up his stride quite a bit we'll change the rein good remember light brush back light brush and then I want you to feel that you're pushing the energy from below your belly button up over the withers up over yes lovely back keep those heels soft pulse 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 good job good job back change your dynamic to rise sit sit two sits and a rise yes <laughs> so this is a really useful exercise two sits and a rise two sits and a rise remember I want to see those heels so length in the back of your calf to keep that heel spongy more length in the back of this inside calf ah good there back good and now normal rising trot on the correct diagonal very light sit send him forward into the contact so light sit sweep forward nice back so I don't I don't want you I don't want you to get comfortable in the saddle I want you to feel that you're sitting on a pin or a really sharp stone good there take a moment back to remember that we want to create a channel in the front end with your hands so those hands need to work as a pair good there good there so when you're ready for the last part of our warm-up I want you to go into a little bit of a canter just a short canter pay attention to your pelvis good there back remember seat bones back and wide forward and narrow back and wide forward and narrow so it's it's really useful in oopsie in terms of imagery to think as your seat bone your pelvis comes back the seat bones grow wide you collect the hind leg and you sweep it forward with you good there back come on good keep them as a pair nice there back soft in those heels good job right now I want you to come back to trot change the rein for the last little bit of our warm-up what we're going to do is we're going to take back stirrups away and we're really going to drop her pelvis into this into the saddle sounds terrible because it sounds like we're making it very heavy but no I really want to deepen the connection between her seat bones the rest of her pelvis back of her spine and her shoulder blades so that we can go into the next stage of our class which is all about the contact right so so uh, this part of the warm-up will keep quite short because this is really hard work for the rider so what I want Beck to do now is I want her to focus on those seat bones traveling forward looking for the slide looking for the glide I want her to feel the length down the back of the calf and of course this is where the bands are really invaluable I want those ankles to stay soft so they can absorb movement and what I really want Beck to do is I want her to focus her big toes towards the bit so we close the inner thigh contact a little right so this is Beck's least favorite part of the warm-up <laughs> not much Beck a little bit of sitting a bit of rising and a little canter right nice there Beck nice find your balance your connection through your pelvis this is nice back lovely remember keep keep the suppleness in the back of that ankle long calf this pace is fine lovely do you think he or do you think you can offer us a little bit of rising trot this is there you go lovely back use the band to bring your pelvis forward and remember think of the movement coming quite close to your pubic bone yes back lovely here nice sitting trot and pick up your canter good job 
Now, feel your pelvis. Back wide, forward narrow. Back wide, forward narrow. When your pelvis comes forward, I want you to look for length down the front of your thighs. Lovely drop back, really lovely. And back to trot. Right, so typically we will do that on both reins. Um, but what I want to do is I want to start working now on Beck's shoulder girdle. And the most important part for us today, the contact. Right, so now we move on to the, the part of this masterclass which focuses on contact. So everything we've done before is warm up. It's, it was getting Beck's body in the right position for us to focus on the finer point, the all important point of contact. Now for a, a lot of riders, they talk about contact and they think about the hand. The best way to think about your contact is actually to think about your shoulder girdle. So that starts and I will go through it together with Beck, the scapula moving through to the collarbone, down the upper arm, through the joint, through these two bones, the ulna and the radius, the wrist bones and into the hand. Because the reality is if anything in the structure is blocked, it's going to impact your contact. So let's just image this on Beck. Beck, do you mind moving forward just a wee bit? So the, what, I, what I want to do is as Beck rides, I want her to have a visual in her mind which part, which joint, where the activation is coming from, what is moving. And the best way to do that is to start with a model. You'll also notice that I don't pay or I don't focus in on the muscle structure so much because here's the reality of it. Most people, when you think of your body, if I say, where's your shoulder blade, you know immediately where to point. However, if I said to you, where is your intercostal muscle? Uh, you know, even I have to have a little think, oh, it's down near my ribs somewhere. But by focusing on the bones, we get a really clear image in our mind and that gives us something to work towards. Scapula, so scapula is your shoulder blade. Clavicle, now riders all know the clavicle because most of us have uh, damaged this bone at some point. <laughs> We're coming down through the humerus, which is the big bone. This is the shoulder, the joint between the arm and the scapula. We're going to look at the elbow joint, the two bones of the lower arm being the radius and the ulna, and just quickly the fingers and the wrist joints. So, back. So we're slightly, if you can see from the model, what I want Beck to do is just to get a visual in her mind's eye of how these bones lay. So we're going to find them on her body in a moment. We're going to tap our way through them. But this is the scapula. Beck knows that the shoulder joint is here. The clavicle wraps around the front and it joins the sternum. So your, I think it's called your breastbone. This is the long arm bone, the shoulder, the elbow joint the two lower arm bones. Now you'll see what's quite interesting, and this is really important when you ride. For riders, you'll see that these bones kind of wrap around one another. So they, they have a bone rhythm to them. They're not straight bones. As a rider, if you ride with piano hands, what you'll see is you change the orientation of these bones and you start to lose some of the mobility through this joint. So when we say ride with thumb on top, what we're looking for is not only that we can follow the bit effectively, we're also looking to be able to mobilize this joint effectively. So you'll often hear trainers tell you, connect your elbow to the bit, right? And, and this is what we're gonna be working on. So this is another useful trick that I can and share with you is two, two balls. One's a table tennis ball, it's a very hard ball. The other one is actually a cat toy without the bell. The bell is super annoying if you ride with the bell, but it's a squishy toy. Now what I'm going to ask Beck to do is I want her to feel the difference as she rides with blocked fingers, with the hard ball, versus the ability she has to change the pressure through the fingers with the soft ball. And then we'll swap over and then we'll start thinking about putting this softness into her hand so that she can feel, articulate the joint, 
articulate the joint, slide the scapula. The reality is if you ride with a blocked or scrunched hand, or believe it or not, sometimes a lot of riders are riding with reins that are too broad for them, it blocks your ability to use the whole shoulder girdle. Really important for your lateral work, your half halts, and just for your general, the well-being of your horse as well. You know, we, we tend to forget we're connected directly through to the mouth. And as human beings, we focus very much on our hands and what our hands can do. So we want to make sure we're effective, but we're soft and we're riding authentically. So I'm going to ask Beck just to do a, a walk and then in the canter, just to feel the difference between the two, the two different structures in her hand and which one she feels she can um, use more effectively. So here we're going to leave Beck alone and let her ride in the walk and the canter and feel the difference between these two hands. Then we'll ask her to come back and just give us her feedback on, on what she felt. I'm, I'm asking Beck to work predominantly in the walk and the canter because these are the, the two gates which are more demanding in terms of contact. You know, if we look at rising trot, our hands are fairly steady in the rising trot. It's the torso that moves. If anything, there's a small opening of the elbow joint as we follow the movement. But in the canter and the walk, we're following the neck. So you can see as Beck's riding, she has a hard ball in one hand a soft ball in the other hand, and already you can see the impact on the way those hands are being positioned. So on her inside hand, she has, it's blocked. She has very little movement opportunity on that inside hand, which means if she wants to influence or ask for flexion, she really has to either drop the hand, move the shoulder, She's, she has to do a lot of work there. Right, Beck, if you could, then do exactly the same on the other rein so we can then have a look at the soft ball in the hand and see what difference that makes. So she'll just change the rein for us. And once again, you know, the, the shirts for me are, they're a real lifesaver because I can see from this distance exactly what Beck's shoulders are doing and how her torso's lined. I can also now start to see what's happening with her upper arm. So. Now Beck is going to pop him into canter, but already you can see the difference between the soft ball in her hand. Right. So far steadier. She doesn't have to make as big a movement to keep the softness. Nice there, Beck. And back to walk. And if you could, uh, Beck, if you could come over and just give us your experience between the soft ball and the hard ball. Um, so much more elastic through the soft hand, uh, so the soft ball, sorry. Feeling very rigid and I get the stiff feeling the whole way up my arm with the harder ball. Um, and having that ability to pulse is definitely the half halt and the softer method softer feeling right so this is something as a, a riding at home you can do, it's quite safe you can do it yourself these balls are really easy to tuck into your pockets and in fact this is something I do when I ride as well because I also although this is my speciality I get a bit blocky through one side of my body so this is a good reminder for me right. what I want to do is I want to put back into the gloves the gloves that have a, a light velcro across the top a, a velcro strap so what these gloves do is number one will work a little bit firstly with proprioception so that she keeps her hands in the right position that the hands are working as a pair and that the hands start to follow bearing in mind the following action is coming from here from the elbow and from the scapula right Beck knows she needs to keep quite a soft hand and we've really woken up all those senses in her hands itself now so we will we will see now as we move forward quite a difference in the way Alfie accepts the contact as it becomes a more following, more forgiving, but never a lack of control. So I'll just swap the gloves. We're just going to do a, a change of gloves. Now, one of the reasons why I like these gloves is because they have a little bit of stretch in them. However, we all know riding horses can sometimes be totally unpredictable and they're they can throw in a little bit of the Highland fling. So I've tested these out. They come apart really easily. So th there's never any danger of being locked into a position. 
right? It also allows, you know, there are times in writing where we do a little bit more with our hands than we, we would like to. So what I typically would say to writers is let's find a good neutral position. Let's find a following hand. If you have to deviate away from that because you've lost your position or the horse is shied or for whatever reason, that's fine. But come back to the neutral. Neutral has to be your home base. So it's not that you're stuck in this position and that's where you stay. It's that this is where you want to come back to. It's the same with your pelvis, right? We always want to come back to neutral. So before we start riding with the gloves, ju just a couple of tips. I've seen riders riding with a TheraBand. Now, I, I think it serves a purpose, but it it's not something that I would encourage for two reasons. Number one, you have no play. I mean, you, you have, you can pull against the band, but if something goes wrong, there's no safety release. And, and I think that's super important. The other thing is that putting the band over the wrist bones blocks the movement. So in fact, what you'll find is that you'll restrict some of the movements through these floating bones that we have here, and the riders will start doing this, right? So working with the gloves, we have a completely different feeling. We have the safety of knowing, or the confidence of knowing that if something goes wrong, we, we just carry on and they will release. But we also have a really interesting point here. So, oops, Alfie's getting a little bit bored with us now. Hold on, buddy. So I'm gonna ask Beck to look for a form of proprioceptive feedback on this part of her hand. Right, so it's right here. Now what this does, this part, it, because Beck will be looking for to f the interaction of the strap and that bone, it will stop her from rolling inwards. Right? So I'm going to ask her to look for that contact piece. Ready? All right, so off we go. So remember, and, and I know for many riders, they, they often smile when I, I go all the way back to this because it is a little bit pony club, but your thumbs need to be on top, right? And the thumbs need to be housed a little bit like the, the shape of a roof on top of the finger. And, and the reason for this is because this is the position that puts us in the most fluid position in terms of being able to use and mobilize all of our joints. Right, so for us, Beck, make sure your fingers are closed, especially that little finger. So an another habit many riders have, and especially show jumpers, is that the little finger pokes out. I, I, do, I do think it's probably the best way to look for a broken finger is to ride with that little finger poking straight out. So Beck is holding onto the gloves. You can see, you can see her hands are now automatically working in a as a pair. Now a couple of things. The gloves are helping level out your, your hands, Beck. Right, so the gloves are helping us keeping the hands on either side of the withers. Beck still has the image in her mind of the squishy balls that we used. So there is a softness in those fingers. They're not lax, they're closed. There is still um, a good feel on the rein, but it's soft. Right, so in the walk, as we watch Elfie walk, we can see that his head nods forward. If we have a good contact on the bit, we need to follow that movement. So I'm going to ask Beck as she walks to look to follow that movement by a slight opening of the elbow joint. Good there. Good there, Beck. Can you feel the bit? All right, so uh, another trick that uh, my trainer taught me as well is look for a smile. So you, you often see the rider will be yanking the bit. Just look for a smile. So think you're asking him to smile out the corner of his mouth. This puts a real softness into that contact. So he'll smile, release, and you follow. Follow in hands as a pair. Nice there, Beck. So Alfie's a little bit tired. He, he has been working really hard and this is a new environment for him as well. So we're going to ask him just to move forward a little bit more. Come on, buddy, you're almost done. And Beck is now going to follow. Now you can also see what has happened in this walk. As Beck focuses on following the movement forward, she started to round her shoulders. So I'm going to ask her, Beck, drop your shoulders your scapulas back into those silk pockets down your back. Really good correction from Beck right there. Right, so remember that the scaps are sliding on the back of the rib cage. So keep them flowing, keep them fluid. 
follow the movement. So we're looking to think you connected elbow to bit. If you ride with what we call a broken line, you lose that elbow to bit connection. So you really are looking for a straight line from the elbow all the way down to the bit. Good there back. Nice there back. Just let him walk. Just let him walk. Ask for a little bit of softness on the inside, a bit of flexion. Close your hands. Yes, good there. Good there back. Remember, we want the hands level. Good job. So Becca's doing a really good job now of keeping her scapula soft and sliding down the back of her ribcage. Really nice. And follow the movement forward through the elbow, not the scap. So a slight open. Yes, good there. So Alfie rewarded us there with a dropping of his head and seeking the contact. Right. So this is in the walk. From a, a biomechanical standpoint, Contact is probably one of the toughest things for riders to achieve. Not tough because it, it's biomechanically impossible, but tough for us as riders because we try and do so much with our hands. You know, often we forget that we need to power from the hind leg, catch it in the hands and recycle that energy back. And for many people that will result in a pulling or a tugging, um, it's, it's a really tough nut to crack, but when you get it, you are rewarded with the horse with the softest mouth, and there's nothing that can beat that flowy feeling. So I'm going to, uh, we've looked at Beck now in the walk, so we can see scaps, we can see the slight opening of the elbows, and once again, the shirt shows us the line and the elbow, beautiful there, Beck, that is lovely, shows us the opening of the elbow joint. In the sitting trot, the hand motion is quite similar, but there is a little bit more left to right. It's small, so his head more steady in the sitting trot. A little bit of sitting trot back, so shorten him a wee bit. Get yourself ready. Nice there back. Lovely. Quick check on that outside scapula back. Slide the scap, keep it soft. Yes, nice there. Now watch that, uh, ah, uh, Alfie, watch, quiet with the legs. Watch that outside hand. What we don't want is the outside hand to get overactive. Think of it as it's quiet hand, it's a steadying hand. Yes, lovely there, Beck. Lovely. Rising trot. So rising trot, the hands stay at one level, the elbow joint opens. Right, so to, uh, just as Beck is walking, we're looking for scapulars that slide and glide on the back of a rib cage. We're looking to see the opening of the elbow joint, the follow in the movement, and that the hands are working as a pair. Really nice there. Now back just a little bit of sitting for us, and then pop him into the canter. So in the sitting trot, good there, steady hands, soft scapulars, Nice there, Beck. Nice. Now pop him into the canter, and I really want you to follow the motion of the head. So open the elbow joints. Yes, good. Can you exaggerate that a little bit for us? Yes, good there, Beck. Think now, your hands, your arms belong to him. They're part of the horse. Yes, lovely, Beck. Thumbs on top. Follow, follow, fo yes, good there, Beck. And it's fine to over-exaggerate the movement to start with. It's better, actually, to put a bigger movement in, and as you work on it, you refine the movement, it becomes smaller, smaller, smaller. Lovely, Beck, so focus. Remember, Beck, I want you to feel your knuckles are pressing on a piece of memory foam. Forward, forward, yes, more forward than back. Forward, yes, good there, Beck. Love, there, super job, super back, bring him back to trot. And walk. And then what I would do is unclip your gloves, walk him on a long rein. So as Beck is just cooling Alfie down, so firstly we have to say thank you to Alfie because he has been a superstar. <laughs> He's worked incredibly hard in a new environment and had a, a four o'clock start this morning. So. Thank you, Alfie. <laughs> and of course, thank you, Beck. <laughs> right, so a couple of things you would notice in that piece on the contact. Number one, 
keep your contact work short, especially if you're struggling or you're, you're just starting to get that feel of contact. What I find is as riders fatigue, we just get more handsy, more grippy, and, and we normally start chest breathing, which impacts the movement of our shoulder girdle and our spine and everything translates. So little pieces of correct work are far more beneficial for you and your horse than long drawn out pieces where you both get fatigued and seriously annoyed with each other. So that would be tip number one, you know, keep, keep these sessions really short. Now the other thing you'll see is that um, in the warm up with the bands and now with the gloves, we don't keep them on the entire session. Right. We, we use them to build the feel and the awareness within our body to think about that movement. Then we take them off and we look for that feel. So in terms of working with your body biomechanically, we would normally only focus on one body part per session. What we've done with Beck this morning is a bit of a marathon session because it, it really is, is a masterclass and we've put both contact and pelvis into the same session. So it is incredibly hard work for the rider. So all of, all of those partners of ours who say, you just sit there, the horse does all the work, please share this video with them <laughs> because it is incredibly hard work. It takes an enormous amount of focus to get your brain and your body to start moving in a synergistic way and in a way that is authentic with the horse. So what we're looking for is we're, we're working in possibly one of the most demanding sports in the world, right? It, it's not only your own body, it's a that needs to be both relaxed but have tone. You need feel, you need awareness, you need to breathe, you need to be quick, you need to be agile, you need to be balanced. It, it, it is a very demanding sport. But we have a partner as well, you know, and, and all of the demands that we place on our body is translated through to this partner. And many times we, uh, we find that we're starting with a school in a horse and we don't focus on ourselves. So this becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy Unless you're sitting right, the horse won't go right. Unless he's going right, you can't sit right. So I keep on coming back to the same thing. Train your body in small, short sessions and then come back and look for the feeling. And if ever you've heard the tale of 10,000 hours of repetition, I'm here to tell you it's not a tale. <laughs> it takes repetition. You know, you think that you've been using your body in a certain way for a long time. Now we want to change the way you use your body. It takes time, it takes patience, and that's both for you and the horse. And, and really what we're looking for is we're looking for authentic riding. We want to use our bodies efficiently and we want to ride our horse and get the performance that we want from the horse in the kindest possible way. Right, so that really is rider biomechanics or train your seat 101. Um, there are many different angles to, or many different parts of the body that we can work with, but typically start with your pelvis, start with your breath, and then move out to the other parts of your bodies. So I hope you enjoyed the session, and uh, I'm sure if you have any questions, you can just pop them on the website.